The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab episode 719 for Tuesday, July 24th, 2018. Ah, Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show. It takes all your questions, tips, cool stuff found, some adds in some of our own tips, some of our own cool stuff found, mixes it all together, makes it fun, makes it entertaining, makes it informative, and makes it so that the goal is that each and every one of us, including us, me and John, your hosts, we all learn at least five new things each and every time we get together. That's how we define success here at Mac Geek Gab, and we have fun doing it. Our sponsors for this episode include a couple of new ones and a couple of returning ones. Masterclass at masterclass.com slash MGG gets you a free seven-day trial to a really cool place where you can learn from the best in the world. We'll talk more about that in a minute. OnePassword.com slash Geek Gab gets you three months free of my favorite password manager. LinkedIn.com slash MGG gets you 50 bucks off towards your first job posting. If you're looking for talent, LinkedIn is the place to do that. And crossover from Code Weavers. If you go to CodeWeavers.com slash MGG, you get 35% off after your 14-day free trial, which you also get at that same link. We'll talk more about all of those things in a moment here, back here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And likewise, back here from a mini vacation event in the Chicago area, but now back here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How are you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? Good, good. As I just mentioned, was at the uh, Mac Stock Expo out in Chicago there. Got to hang out with uh, all the Mac cool kids pretty much. Yeah, it'd be terrible if, uh, if if something bad happened at that event. The uh, Apple podcasting ecosphere would take a major hit. Yeah, it really <laughs> is kind of uh, at, at 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 in a sense certainly has a lot of uh, the best Mac podcasters there. Um, it, it you know it's almost a, a Mac podcasting event, and, and and that's where it's that's where its roots are, right? You know, Mike's a podcaster, and obviously, um, you know. And so, and Barry Falk, a big fan of podcasts, and the two of them are sort of at the core of of what brought it together. Even though you know, Mac Stock itself is is just is Mike's event. But yeah, yeah, really, um, I love that conference. I'm, I was sorry to have had to miss it. It seems like every other year it coincides perfectly or imperfectly with uh, family travels for me. But um, yeah, but I'm I hoping even, uh... to make it next year. Yeah. And I even learned a little something. That's the see. That's what we do, right, man? That's great. I'm glad In to many hear. of the sessions, I think yeah. the biggest the, the 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 thing that was totally new to me that I I knew about but I hadn't looked at, but I I think I will. I'm not sure what I'll do with it, but um, markup, mark down, mark down. Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there was a, a, a Adam uh, Adam Christensen did a thing on markdown, and actually yep. uh, uh, our friend Brett. Um, one of the other people there actually writes a markdown parser, which yep. is cool, and uh, we got to do some hands-on with that. It's uh, it's pretty neat stuff. It is neat stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We well, you know, we use WordPress internally here for all of our stuff and for publishing Mac Geekab, but also for publishing all of Mac Observer and and all of that. And on the back end, you know, you can use Markdown. Uh, the back end editor supports full markdown and and i think at least one of the authors authors here writes in in markdown um for those of you that don't know markdown was created actually by john gruber uh and uh the the guy who writes daring fireball fireball and does that podcast the talk show he created it a long time ago as a way of having um he wanted something that wasn't html but wanted the ability to write and and 
in form formatting, right? So that if, if you want to do something in bold, you wrap stars around it. If you want italics, you put underlines around it. And, and, and there's, of course, far more to it than just that. But that was sort of the idea for, for Markdown was something that could be read as plain text, but also then formatted uh, by a parser automatically to, to create, um, you know, formatted, stylized text uh for you know for articles on on a website like you know mac observer or in his case like like daring fireball so yeah so that's that's where markdown started and and now it's very very widely adopted um but uh, you know as, as you're finding yeah it's pretty it's a pretty cool thing and it's 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 really easy to wrap your head around if you're doing that type of thing where you're you're writing a lot uh, that that is built to then be published uh, on the web. Markdown is very, very much worth your time to 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 consider. It's way better than writing in say Microsoft Word uh, or Pages and then trying to copy that into a WYSIWYG editor. And what you what happens is you inherit all of this weird font stuff and everything that just gets in the way. And Markdown keeps it all very clean. So, and it's all text. And it's all text, right? That's right. Yeah, exactly. Whereas I think, I mean, technically, you it's always could, HTML, but you could yeah. stylize your yeah. So, for example, if you want to make something bold, I think in HTML, you would do uh, you know left, you know left thing slash b would oh something yep. like that. But but it's it yeah. So it makes it even simpler in that uh you know you shouldn't have any uh, parsing problems. Well, and it makes Markdown is far more human readable. Like if you took a Markdown yes. version of an article, uh, you could read it as a human and it would make it would be far more more uh, uh, you'd be able to comprehend it a lot easier than you would something with, you know, that had HTML formatting wrapped all around it. So, yeah. Coolio, coolio. All right. Let's um, we've had a bunch of follow ups from the, the last couple episodes. You know, as you as you probably know, we recorded the last two uh, over two weeks ago and then released them while John and I were both sort of traveling. And, uh, and we have a lot of follow-ups here. We had a discussion, um, about capturing text from the screen in an, in an image and, and then converting that to actual text. So if an image has some text in it, you know, what can you do with that? And we had a, so many of you write in about how to address that. And so we'll start with Neil. Neil says, uh, I'm in the middle of the podcast, but I think that these links might be uh, some help. He says there is an app called Condense. Uh, at, uh, yeah, Condense at CondenseApp.com. And of course, on the App Store, which can perform OCR on the text contained in a selected area of the screen. I have used it in the past. The OCR is not, in my experience, fully reliable, but it still might be of benefit for the writer looking to have the screen read to him by performing OCR on parts of the screen. Very, very interesting. So thank you so much for that, Neil. That's, uh, that's great. We will, we will put that link in the show notes as we always do. As we always do. Any thoughts about that, John, before we move on to Greg's comment about the same same kind of thing? No, not really. All no, right. these uh, most of these all are just, you know, really clever ways of um, extracting text from an image, which is uh, somewhat of a complex. It's, it's non-trivial. That's right. Yep. And these things all make it trivial. Greg uh, says, I'm blind. And I use OCR software all the time. He says, I use an app called Microsoft Seeing AI, which allows you to grab text from a photo or basically anything, and it reads it out to you in real time. It also allows you to scan documents and save them. Uh, it reads currencies, too. It does a lot more other things that assist the blind and the visually impaired. Thank you so much, Greg. That's uh, what, a, what, a, what a cool app. Um, and it's available for free. We put a, again, a link will be in the show notes for you, but, um, yeah, very cool from Microsoft, from Microsoft. I know, man. Yep. Yep. They got, well, they have smart people at Microsoft, like, which is no great surprise. You know, we, mm -hmm. we give Microsoft a lot of guff because, you know, windows, but, um, but you know, there's, there's really smart people doing cool things there. Just like there are a lot of companies. 
along the same lines, Ev the Nerd writes in and says, uh, I am dyslexic. And this is what helps me read all the time in terms of having the iPhone read non-selectable text inside of accessibility speech uh, in settings. You can turn on speak screen uh, that will speak all the text on the screen. So then all you have to do is scroll and zoom to the body of a web page. You want it to speak and swipe down with two fingers and it will start speaking the text. I use this constantly, especially when the admins of the church I work for send out the notes of their meeting. And I have to read the whole thing to get a couple of sentences that pertain to me. Now I can do this when working and have my hands and eyes free to do other things. So very cool. So that's not coming from an image, but that is just allowing it to, to kind of do that. You know, you can select text on iOS and choose speak, but a lot of times web pages aren't easy to, uh, to select the, the way Safari renders things on the page can make it very cumbersome to, to quickly select something and choose speak. So this works very, very well. So thanks, Ev. Thanks everybody that for those, that's great. Uh, that then brings us, John, into the scanning world, which starts to get also interesting. And uh, and we'll jump to Elliot to start us from there. Uh, Elliot says, in show 718, you asked about on-the-fly OCR of text from images. I use one of two apps to do each of these perfectly. One is Prismo Go. And the other is Text Grabber from Abby, A-B-B-Y-Y. And so there you go. That will OCR the images that you've that you've scanned in. And of course, you could take a screenshot and that then becomes a scanned image just like or an image just like something you would have scanned. So lots of great stuff here, man. Any uh, any comments on this before we keep going, John? No, Abby. Yeah, I think Abby gets bundled with um... scan snap, I think. Yeah, I've, I've seen it bundled with with various scanners. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, whenever you get an image scanner, be sure to look at the goodies they throw in there because they probably will toss in something that'll do OCR for you. Right, that's true. Yeah, I hadn't quite thought about that. Um, Neil, uh, what, what, I was trying to think if he had, uh, if he had something. Yeah, he said um, he he talked about in terms of scanning book pages. There was the the whole cookbook scanning thing. Right, which we'll get to here. A couple other people have comments about it. Um, but he says in terms of scanning book pages, there's a scanner from ScanSnap, the model SV600, designed for scanning book pages and which claims to perform distortion correction, correction to deal with the curve on the pages from the binding. He says, I've not seen it in operation, so I can't vouch for its function, but it might be of use to people looking to scan books, especially cookbooks. Uh, it's, but it's not cheap. He says it's currently on sale from Fujitsu at eight ninety five. So there you go. Uh, that I think is the one that I recall seeing at a show. The only thing I don't think it does is it will not flip the pages for you. I think you still have to, you have to have someone do that manual. That's a manual just, thing. That's right. Yep. <laughs> yep. For sure. For sure. I'm thinking I'd almost want to build a contraption that would flip the pages. Yeah, good luck, man. Be a fun little project. Yeah, like deciding how much pressure to apply to pull any given page, right? I mean, if you think about it, like when any of us sit down to flip the pages of a book, right? It it just happens automatically. We don't even think about it. But if you do stop to think about it, think about like the amount of physics that your body and brain are applying to that process. It's intensely complex, right? Because if you put too much pressure on, you'll bend the page. If you put really too much pressure on, you'll get four pages, right? You just want to get just enough to lift that page and go. And of course, we all know that sometimes our hands are too dry. So you need to, you know, wet your finger, but again, don't wet it too much. Otherwise you'll soak the page. You just want enough to get some, you know, a little bit of friction. It's, um, that would be quite, uh, quite a thing to build that could do it universally, right? If you knew the thickness and weight of the pages that you were pulling and, and, and not just thickness and, and weight, but, but also the texture of those pages, because some pages are shiny and require a different approach. If you knew that going in and could eliminate those variables, that would be interesting, but otherwise, right. Am I, am I crazy? I know. I'm oh, no, 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 yeah. you're not. I'm, I'm, I just had an image in my head is uh, the, could you train Hector D bird? To yes, do that and uh, I would imagine it's possible, but I think more than likely Hector would destroy the book. 
Hector would destroy the book. <laughs> yeah, Hector loves to destroy books. Hector is uh, an African gray parrot that has lived in the Mac uh, industry for all of her 20... Oh, gosh, how old is she now? 24, maybe? 24 years. So, um, started with Ambrosia and then took kind of a, a an interesting and circuitous path and, and has... Uh, has wound up with us and the plan is that that she will remain with us for either the rest of her life or the rest of ours whichever comes first parrots tend to live or can live a very very long time so yeah interesting all right uh sticking with this why not uh bill says uh the best results uh, can be had using an open source program called scan Taylor, this is for the cookbooks thing, and it's uh, it's available at code.google.com, uh, and I'll put a link for that, and also scantaylor.org, S-C-A-N-T-A-I-L-O-R. Over the past few years, I have scanned hundreds of books and thousands of pieces of sheet music, and have found that Scan Taylor is essential to getting good, clean pages. Scan Taylor does things like split pages, de-skew them, darken text, lighten backgrounds, add margins, eliminate speckles, set DPI, and generally clean things up. Once you've got clear images from Scan Taylor, you can convert them to PDF and o even OCR them using software such as Abby's Fine Reader, and again, that's A-B-B-Y-Y, uh, PDF Pen, DevonThink, and Adobe Acrobat Pro. Uh, there are many options in this space, including open source programs and built-in automator actions. Whatever PDF slash OCR pro programs you use, ScanTailor is the secret sauce that makes your PDFs look good. You'll also get better OCR from text images created by ScanTailor. So, uh, so thank you. Yeah, and he says uh, there's a lot of help for book scanning at DIYBookScanner.org in the forum. So we will definitely put... Um, that link in the show notes, which of course I'm doing right now, which is why I have to pause when I speak. Cause you know, we humans are not actually good at doing more than one thing at a time, despite our misconceptions to the contrary. Pretty good. Huh, John? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, one more free option. And then one more very specified option before we move topics here, Patrick along these lines, says uh in regards to converting images into text although this is not an on-the-fly solution the solution i use to convert images to text uh is for the purpose of having my mac dictate the text to me i use an online ocr converter called free online ocr at free-ocr.com that converts the text in an image electronically for me i sometimes take it further and convert the text into an audio file that i can play later you can create automator scripts to do this for you in the Mac, but there are other online services that have even better naturally sounding voices. I use another online service called from text to speech.com that uh, uses the George voice, or at least the George voice is the one that he has chosen. So from text to speech.com. I don't know. That's, that's where it is, right? Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, and then Harvey comes up with uh, perhaps the most specified answer that we have seen to this. He says, uh, you were asking about the way to scan cookbook index pages. He says, but wait, check out eatyourbooks.com. They've already got them scanned and you can search them online. You can even search a database with five books of your choice for free. Uh, there's a fee to search additional books. Then all you need to do is open your cookbook to the page number indicated online. Bon appetit. So when there's a will, there's a way. I like it. That's good. Thanks, everybody, for all your tips on that stuff. That's um, it's crazy how much that, like I, we've gotten more. Com I mean, I didn't read half the comments that we got about this, but um, but yeah, good stuff, huh, man? Right. Good. Yeah, you know, I think in the back of my mind, I was remembering that Google was doing something with OCR. Okay. I actually came up with something here. Google's OCR software now works. Hmm. Yeah, is there, uh, is there a link or anything? I'll put a little placeholder in the show notes. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look more into it. I'm not sure about the availability. I know it created a... a okay. 
was it them or Amazon? I think that somebody was OCRing books. And, oh, and Amazon. All upset. Amazon, you definitely like. I find uh, Google searches pointing me like deep into books at Amazon all the time. Yeah, and I can see where people would get you know mildly upset about it. it they do it. They they display it in a. I think a mostly useful way you actually see the scan of the book page and then the text there is, is sort of keyed to the words that are, that are in it. So you can, you know, kind of go through and find, and it works, it works really well. Uh, at least the, the little bit that I've used it, I, but I think it's cumbersome enough that you wouldn't want to read a book that way. And, and I don't know if there's a maximum number of pages or something that, that stops you there too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, can I talk about two of our sponsors uh, at the moment, John? Please do. Awesome. Our first sponsor for this episode is a new sponsor, Masterclass at masterclass.com slash MGG, where you can go to get a free seven-day trial of this awesome place that has courses taught by like brand name experts in their field. Imagine learning new recipes from Gordon Ramsay, right? That's one of the things you can do at masterclass.com slash MGG or photography tips from Annie Leibovitz, right? That's what masterclass does. Online classes taught by the best in the world. And of co- as you would imagine, when you're working with the best talent in the world, you're off also working with the best cinematic production quality. Um, and th- they have on-demand lessons loaded with exclusive content that you'll only find on Masterclass. Malcolm Gladwell on interviewing. Ron Howard on collabor- collaboration. Astronaut Chris Hadfield on traveling to Mars, right? And new classes are always being created and added. So whether you're, you know, checking something out for a hobby or expanding your your skill set for your career, Masterclass has the classes for you. Really, really cool stuff. So like I said, check it out. For a limited time, you get to go to masterclass.com slash MGG. You got to check this website out. It's so well done. I I mean, like just, it it really blew me away. You know, we're so used to this kind of, and there's nothing wrong with, with just, you know, sort of homegrown uh, video classes and stuff. Right. But it's very different when you get to go to masterclass.com slash MGG, you get a free seven day trial, learn from the best in the world, at masterclass.com slash MGG. Again, that's masterclass.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Masterclass for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor for today is 1Password for the Mac. It's really actually 1Password for the Mac, for iOS, for Windows, for Android. Go to 1Password, the number 1Password.com slash GeekGab. It's a little different. Uh, This is a password manager, right? And you need a password manager. You can't use the same password everywhere. You know that. We talk about this all the time. 1Password is my favorite password manager. I've tried them all. Uh, It's the one that I, I, I always come back to after I test something new. They keep adding new features. They've got a thing in the new version that will check to see if your password, if any of your passwords are on the lists of passwords that have sort of leaked out into the world. They don't share your passwords with these lists. Of course, they download the list to your computer and compare it there, but it works out really, really, really well. You got to check this out. You need a password manager. Go get three months for free of one password at one, the number one password.com slash geek gab and make it really easy to use different passwords everywhere, sync them everywhere, and just make your life safer and easier, right? One password is one of those, those rare things that adds both security and convenience simultaneously. Y- you can't not use it. OnePassword.com slash GeekGab for three months free. Our thanks to the folks at OnePassword and Agile for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, 
Shall we move on here? We have uh, we have some more tips. In fact, I have uh, an audio tip from our friend Allison, who I think you saw this weekend at Max Talk. Uh, oh, yeah. Relating to our UPS discussion. I've learned almost everything I know about UPS is from Dave Hamilton. And uh, be, living out in California, we don't really have a huge need for them, but I uh, do find them very useful, and I have one. And I wanted to make a recommendation to people buying a new one, a recommendation that Dave himself might never think of as a, as a necessary recommendation because he never experienced what I experienced with mine. We've had one for quite a while. It was run from CyberPower. It was pretty old. It was maybe eight years old. And um, my two-year-old grandson walked into the room where it was, and it happened to be at eye level to him. And so he reached up and he hit the power button. So down came all of my Drobos and my uh, my router, everything. Oh, it was just a big mess. And about an hour later, he did it again. Well, shortly after that, my uh, my UPS died, and we figured it was as old as it was. It probably wasn't worth replacing the battery, so we ended up getting a new one. We got a CyberPower 1500 uh, volt amp unit, and uh, it has one very, very important feature. You can't just press the power button and shut it off. When you press the power button, you have to hold it down for like, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds before it'll shut off. So uh, my recommendation when choosing a UPS is that it not have a power supply that you can shut off with a single button, just in case you have wee ones running around your house. Yeah, so uh, her advice is great. And I wish I had had this advice about 13 and a half months ago, because uh, it, Allison listens to a lot of Mac Geek M, but she must have missed episode 664, which we titled Puck Killed the Wi-Fi, because Puck, our cat, killed the Wi-Fi by doing exactly the same thing. He stepped on the button and then he did it again. So now we have a bottle cap taped over the button of that UPS that we can flip up and turn the UPS off or on if we so choose, but Puck cannot step on it to turn it off. So yeah, I, I the, and the newer ones, actually she, she said she got a cyber power, but the link she sent me was for the same one that I use in the office, which is the uh, APC BR 1500 G, I think. And that one, as she said, you have to hold the power button down for uh, a not insignificant amount of time before it will turn off. That that can be a very handy feature. You don't want these things simply turning off willy-nilly. The whole point, in fact, is that they do not let things that are plugged into them get turned off willy-nilly. So, yeah, good advice. Tape over the power button if it is a, you know, one one tap and it's off kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. or, still, Go ahead, yeah. I'm saying, uh, but... So at least to make it childproof, put it um, above <laughs> um, child level. Yeah. Like maybe uh, put it in an elevated position, though I don't think that would work too well with the cat. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't have mattered. Uh, this one, the one that, that, um, that Puck was turning off is on the floor behind the TV. And that's also where our cable modem was. I've actually... I, I keep going back and forth with having the cable modem at the house versus here at the office. Uh, now the cable modem's here with the here at the office for for and different you know, reasons. But yeah, now that I think about it, if I had to design something that could not e be easily turned off, I'd almost think of doing something like kind of like the nuclear launch. Oh you know, yeah, nuclear you hold, missile launch thing. Yeah, where engaging one device doesn't perform the action. You actually have to engage at least two devices in the case of. You know, or at least what I've seen in the movies, you need two keys from two individuals to right. agree to. So I'm well, wondering if, you know, designing one with two buttons that, you know, most, uh, you know, I mean, a child may be able to figure it out. The cat, well, maybe the cat could figure it out. I don't, too. Know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're right. Something that can't happen accidentally, certainly, is, is a good thing. Yeah. Like control, alt, delete, right? Keys on opposite corners of the keyboard. So that, yes. yep, yep. Ah, fun stuff, fun stuff. All right. Uh, this is simply just a cool thing that Gene sent in. He says, uh, open Google Maps in a browser. So maps.google.com. Select the satellite layer. Hold shift. Now, I'm going to warn you before I tell you how to do this. Gene sent this email in. I was in a, you know, I got home from vacation, had a lot of your email to go through. And, uh, and, and I lost 10 minutes after reading Gene's email, because this was so cool. Uh, so open Google Maps in a browser, select the satellite layer, hold shift. Then 
click and drag on the map in the screen and watch as it rotates uh, into a controllable, zoomable 3D view. He says it works great in the mountains as well as for buildings in bigger cities where oblique information has been gathered. Uh, he says, I'm not sure when this cool stuff was added. Maybe it has been there for a long time and I just found it. The view is very similar to what Google Earth and Google Earth Pro, which Pro is now free, uh, have been offering for a long time. It is cool. Not everything has this, as he calls it, oblique information. Uh, some cities do. Some areas do not. I actually like wound up driving the map up from my house to the lake where my son is at camp. And it's a lake I know very, very well because we vacationed there many times um, as well. And and like there were some edges of the islands that were obviously not rendered quite right. But that's very nitpicky. I still lost 10 minutes driving around in there. It's pretty, pretty cool. So. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. Thanks for sending that in, Gene. I don't. Had you seen that before, John? Is that new to you? Are you now lost in this? <laughs> uh, I tried it uh, when I was going through the agenda. I okay. tried it earlier today. And, yeah. Um, no, it's a, you know, it's kind of like you're, you're in a little airplane flying over a train. Yeah. Uh, and you train. can change your altitude. Like that's the cool part is you can, if, as you zoom in, you get closer in on it. Uh, yeah. It's very cool. Very, very cool. So, you know what, you, you know what I have to try, and this is something that's interesting to do with Google maps for a lot of places. There's certain things that are fuzzed out because they're sensitive Really? I think the last time I looked at Google Maps, that's the reason I went there. It's like, you know, let's, uh, you know, look at this, uh, you know, like the White House, I think at one point had the top, you know, blurred out because there's, uh, you know, secret sensors or something there. Military installations, all that fun stuff. Yeah, I think if, if you try to go to certain places, um, you may not get a full resolution of right. rendering of it. Interesting. Interesting. Cool. Huh. Very, very cool. Um in 718, we talked about backing up your Synology, and, and that got, got us into a discussion about various cloud services, specifically the ones that were supported by Synology, but just other cloud services, too, that you know you could back up to. And I mentioned one called Hubic, H-U-B-I-C, that I'd been using and was telling you about it, John, because you know I suggested maybe you should use it, because I think they were giving like 25 or 30 gigs free of online storage, and, and, I, was using, and I still am using that. Unfortunately... As Seth informs us, Hubic is now closed to new customers. It really wasn't their core business, and it wound up growing faster than they uh, than than worked for them. So they will continue to support it for any of us that had signed up prior to whenever they they did this close. But it is now closed. So sorry about the uh, potentially misleading comments in the last show. It's uh, they are looking for someone to take over that business, but. My guess is if if and when they do that, the kind of the free deals will change as as you would expect. It's almost too good to be true, I think. And in fact, maybe it was. So there you go. Thanks for that, Seth. And sorry about that. Um, I was traveling, John, as you know, and uh, we were in many uh, cities. We were in. Las Vegas, we were in the Los Angeles area, and then my wife and I went up to Lake Tahoe, uh, just kind of bouncing around the West Coast. And I've learned when walking around in cities, especially with my phone where I need to like be looking at maps or whatever, I like to have a good firm grip on my phone. And in the past, I've always used handle cases, H-A-N-D-L, because they've got like a little, it's a very flat handle on the back that you kind of slip your fingers into and then it it really kind of snugs that phone up on your hand so you can really trust that even if you lose your grip for a moment on the phone it's not going anywhere because it's sort of wedged between two of your fingers with the way this case is uh as we were prepping for this trip i realized i did not have a handle case for my iphone 10 so i went with plan b which was i put a pop socket on my iPhone case. If, for those of you that haven't seen it, and, and I think if you're not like, you know, a teenager, you might not know what a pop socket is, but, it, but it, they seem to be growing in popularity. They are a, an adhesive, uh, it's a little disc, essentially, that, that you, a telescoping disc that you uh, adhere to the back of your phone. 
and then it can flatten almost to the, you know, to the, to your case, but then you pull it out and it creates this little telescope thing that serves the same purpose. You, you kind of wedge it between your, I wedge mine between my index and middle fingers on the hand that I'm holding the phone with. And it does sort of the same thing as the handle case. And, uh, and, and then you can kind of wedge it. It, it. To me, the the UX of the pop socket isn't quite as good as the handle case, but of course it works with any case. And I happened to have one, which meant that, you know, the day that I was packing for the trip, it was like, oh, right, got this problem solved. Um, and there you go. And much to my surprise, John, when I got home, I tried wireless charging, Qi charging with the pop socket on there. And it actually still worked. Um, I was able to charge my phone with the charger in the car, uh, through the pop socket, even though it added, you know, quite a bit of thickness to it. It still was no. enough. Well, what's the, what's the material? It's plastic. Plastic. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. you should be able to get through that. No, yeah. I think you'd have issues. Yeah. If something's metallic, I think is the mm. only way you'd have, uh, if there's any sort of metal, then that, that would certainly, uh, break the induction. Right. Mechanism there. Right. Yeah. Any right, other material, sure. I think it should be able to get through it. Though you bring up a good point is that, you know, if it's too far away, right. you know, if the case is too thick, that may also, yep. at the very least, impact the uh, the effectiveness of the signal. You may, you may not get full charge if it's yeah, exactly. too far away. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, but it uh, it's a cool thing. Uh, really, you know, I, I'm, I'm always worried about dropping my phone, especially walking. And, you know, using directions like in city streets, I, like I'm always worried about, you know, getting jostled or, you know, bumping something and then the phone drops and that's always a bad scene. So cool, cool. Uh, Todd has a little quick tip. Uh, I suppose I could have found a way to put this in our easier ways to see stuff on the screen uh, segment earlier in the show. But really, it's quite separate from that. Todd says, often on my iPhone, there are apps or screens where I cannot zoom in. Uh, he says, what I do in those cases is I take a screenshot. Then, because of the way iOS 11 works with screenshots and it puts it in the lower left corner, I just tap on the image in the lower corner and I zoom in on the screen screenshot. Uh, he says, note that you have to zoom out if you want to move to another section and zoom in. But the nice part is after, you know, he says after he zooms in, he clicks done and it offers to save or delete the screenshot. So he's not left with, you know, his photo library littered with all these screenshots. He just deletes it when he's done after he's finished zooming in. Nice little, nice little tip. I like it. Um, there have certainly been times where it's like, what does that say? Or I want to read that better. And uh, doing a screen, a screenshot would solve that problem. So thanks, Todd. Good stuff. Fun, huh, John? Oh, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes yeah. Sense. It makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this I'm categorizing this as a tip though. It certainly came in as a question. Listener Alan uh, wrote in asking, he says, and, and the tip is, I didn't even know you could do this. So, uh, you know, sort of a double layer here. He says prior to high Sierra, I could right click on a dock icon of an app and within the options section, it would show a menu, including the option to assign to this desktop, which allowed me to specify, for instance, that I want mail to always open in desktop number four. So if you are running uh, mission control, is that what we call it now in High Sierra? Right? Yeah, mission control, where you can have multiple uh, spaces running, right? then you can have apps automatically launch into specific spaces. Now, you have to have those spaces created. Uh, there's many ways to invoke mission control. The most common one with a trackpad is you swipe all four fingers up on the trackpad, and then that will sort of bring down the mission control bar, and you can add a desktop with the plus sign in the upper right corner. And then you can do this thing. Um, his problem is that even though this still is supposed to work in high Sierra for him, that option simply wouldn't appear even when he had multiple desktops open. He said, uh, I was messing around with it one day and I did see it appear, but it's not consistent. And most of the time it's not there. So we found that by going into system preferences, mission control, and then unchecking displays have separate spaces 
that turned the option back or resurfaced that option for him. The question, and I'm still waiting on a reply on this as of at least as of the last time I checked before we started recording. The question is if now unchecking that box uh, or, or rechecking that box would also leave it. Is it just a scenario where it needed to be turned off and then on again, as so many things can be in Mac OS uh, these days? It's worth remembering just from a troubleshooting standpoint that all that happens when you make settings changes in the UI, you know, especially in system preferences, is it's writing a new entry or replacing an entry in a P list file in, you know, usually your preferences folder, it could be anywhere uh, that the system uses. Sometimes those files can get corrupted. And when you change a setting, it's rewriting at least a portion of those files or that file. And that can fix a problem. So that's why a lot of times, you know, turn the setting off, close system preferences, reopen pre system preferences, turn the setting on or vice versa. Uh, can solve problems. It's 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 not voodoo. It's just you know sort of a way of of very meticulously and and surgically dealing with that corruption. So there you go. That's right. Did I get that right, John? As far as I know. Cool. That's one way to do it. It's another version of turning it off and on again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, it's nice to know why these things work. And then that one seemed like that 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 solution seems to work a, on a lot of things and I think that's why it's just like okay, yeah, something in the file, you know, a an end parenthesis or an end semicolon or an end bracket got lost somewhere and so things aren't being parsed right and yada yada yada. Uh, you could go into the file and edit it manually, but unless you know what it's supposed to look like, uh, it's very hard to do that and guess correctly. Not impossible, uh, but you have to have some sense of, of whether it's actually wrong or not. Whereas flipping the, the switch, it's already hard coded into, say, the system preferences app, what that or the preference pane in this case, you know, what what to write to that file or what to change in that file. So it's a safer bet if it works. And often it does. I finally get to use AirPlay 2 in my house now, John, thanks to Sonos. Um, and this is a pretty cool thing. Uh, I found myself last night, you know, we were in Tahoe, uh, of course, seeing the band Fish, because Lisa and I like to do things like that. And we, um, you know, we get uh, now, we used to get, with our ticket purchase, we used to get streams uh, we used to get downloads of the show. And sometimes it's fun to listen back to a show you were at, especially if it was a good show. Now, though, they've changed it, and we don't get the download for, quote-unquote, free with our ticket. We just get the ability to stream it, and only to the app on our phones. So I was like, oh, I really want to kind of listen to this while we were making dinner last night. I'm like, I want to listen to this while we're, you know, while we're making dinner on the Sonos in the kitchen, and the thing is, our kitchen Sonos is not one of the models that supports AirPlay 2, but we have a model in the house that supports AirPlay 2. We have several, but in this case, the new Sonos Beam that we just talked about recently supports AirPlay 2. And so what I did was I AirPlayed from the live fish app on my iPhone to the uh, Beam. And then from there, I was able to do the multi-room thing and pair the beam with the, the speakers in the kitchen. So I had the music coming out of both places, which is actually what I would have wanted, wanted anyway. And then boom, I was, I was, you know, streaming from my phone. So even though the speakers in the kitchen didn't, don't support AirPlay 2, once you have one speaker that does, that can be the gateway. And, and then, um, you know, and then it uses the Sonos stuff to magic to, to stream. So AirPlay 2 is pretty cool, man. Being able to select multiple speakers right there and do all that stuff. Um, it's a pretty good UX. And I, I'm pretty sure Sonos is the first company to, to really have that uh, running on non-Apple hardware. So, so it, it's pretty cool. Um, very well done. So kudos to everybody. Sonos, Apple, everywhere that worked to make that possible. But the nice part was here was this app that I don't think has been updated, you know, but it supports AirPlay and supports those frameworks. 
And so iOS was like, yeah, of course, if you support AirPlay, then you support AirPlay too, because that's just how, you know, the frameworks work. They, they get expanded and you don't have to do anything different to your app. We'll take care of it from there. And it just, it just worked. It was like, Hey, I can solve this problem now, which was great. So cool, cool stuff, man. We're living in the future, my friend. No, I'm not. You're not living in the future. <laughs> I'm living in the present. How can you live in the future? It's impossible. Well, actually, no. I don't know that it is. I, I really think this whole time as a linear construct thing is is just uh, something that Overrated. we. Well, no, I think it's I, I think it's necessary, right? I mean, our our not not just our feeble human brains, but but our our human bodies are are very temporally rooted, right? So we really can only experience time in this linear thing, but but I don't think time is is linear like that. I, 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 I think it's it sort of exists. You know, we, well, depend, we depending we, on what you're doing, time can certainly seem to accelerate or slow down. Mm-hmm. It's true, and we can only experience one moment at a time, right? We, like we can't we can't really like you know like I said earlier, we're, our brains just aren't built to do more than one thing at a time, even though we try to trick ourselves and think that they are. Um, you know, or to, to, to focus on more than one thing at a time, obviously our brains can, can do multiple things. You know, we, we can, we, we're breathing and our bodies are doing all these amazing things, uh, sort of on autopilot, but in terms of our focus, it really is just one thing at a time. And, uh, and so I think because of that, you know, we can't think about all of time at once. You know, we have memories. That's our way of experiencing past times. So I don't know. Or you could live in the past. There's a great Jethro Tull song about that, man. I'll put a link to, uh, uh, I, I've always liked that tune. It's a, the Jethro Tull's a, an interesting band, man. It's, uh, but anyway, I'll put a link to that. So, Hey, uh, can I take us to our second round of, uh, of sponsors here? My friend, is that, uh, is that Absolutely. okay by you? Cool. Our next sponsor is LinkedIn. At linkedin.com slash MGG, you'll get $50 off your first job posting. You know, the right hire can make a huge impact on your business. And that's why it is super important to find the right person. I, I can tell you stories of, you know, detrimental things that have happened uh, for me and our businesses over the years by hiring the wrong person. You've got to hire very, very carefully. But it's hard these days to find people, right? It's always been hard to find people. It seems like it's even harder now. And so you kind of want to look for people uh, that are looking for a job, but you also want to look for people that aren't necessarily looking for a job. And where are all of those people connected? LinkedIn. Think about it, right? They've got a leg up on everything because people that aren't looking for jobs are also engaged on LinkedIn and making sure their profiles are up to date and all of that stuff. You know, people go to LinkedIn every day to grow professional and, and, and some people of course discover new job opportunities there. 70% of the U S workforce is already on LinkedIn and LinkedIn jobs matches people to the role that you need based on more about who they are, their skills, their interests, and even how open they are to new opportunities. That way your job post gets seen by the right people. Most LinkedIn members haven't recently visited job boards, but nine out of 10 are open to new opportunities, of course. So you can only reach these people on LinkedIn. So check it out. Go to linkedin.com slash MGG and get $50 off your first job post. Again, that's linkedin.com slash MGG to get 50 bucks off your first job post. One more time, linkedin.com slash MGG. Terms and conditions apply as they always do. Check it out. Our thanks to LinkedIn for sponsoring this episode. Crossover from Code Weavers. Look, if you go to codeweavers.com slash MGG, you get a 14-day free trial of crossover. And it's a cool, really cool thing, right? Because it lets you run Windows apps on your Mac without needing to muck around with Windows. What were we just talking about earlier in the show? You know, we said Microsoft gets a bad rap. They make some cool stuff, but why do they get the bad rap? Windows. Because Windows, I mean, 
Why do you want to run Windows? But sometimes you have to run a Windows app or sometimes you just want to run a Windows app. Maybe there's a fun game you want to play and it's Windows only or it runs better via the Windows version. Well, check it out with Crossover. Go to CodeWeavers.com slash MGG. Download your 14-day free trial and you get to just run the app. You don't, not only do you not have to run Windows, you don't have to buy a Windows license. You don't have to mess around with, you know, Windows virus protection. None of that because it just runs the app without having to run a Windows environment around it. It, it re- it's not even that it hides the Windows environment. It, it literally isn't running it. It's just sort of translating the frameworks in there using some crazy voodoo. It's actually using something called Wine, but it's not an emulator. It's just doing all this translation. You got to check it out. And if you've tried it in the past and it hasn't worked for you, never fret because the folks at Code Weavers have made massive changes recently. Crossover for the Mac 17 is their most powerful version yet. Not only do you get the 14-day free trial when you go to codeweavers.com slash MGG, you also get 35% off of a one-year subscription of Crossover for the Mac. So go check it out. Again, that's codeweavers.com slash MGG. And our thanks to the folks at Code Weavers, not only for sponsoring the episode, but for making Crossover and continuing to make it so much better. And it's always so much better than Windows. Thanks. And there we are. All right, John. Let's see. We've got... Uh, you want to take us to Robert, my friend? Let's see. I think I will take us to Robert. Awesome. Ah, there's Robert. Well, cool. Get, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You want me to talk about a quick, cool go. stuff? Okay, you got it. All right, good. No, no, we're good. Okay, cool. <clears throat> I know I'm jumping around the agenda a little bit, so yeah, cool. All right. So Robert says, I know you probably hear this all the time, but my 2010 iMac is running slow. Just switching between this email and an open Safari app gives me a beach ball. I went to System Preferences and did a startup item request, and this is the list that returned. And he has Alfred 3, Keyboard Maestro, Text Expander, DD Assist, which is a Drobo thing, Default Folder 10, Mail, and Amazon Drive. That, that seems pretty minimal, actually. Yeah, it does, yeah. Um, I know these app take, apps take up resources, but I can't believe they should slow my system down so much. I have a feeling there is more running than the just these well yes there is right um i've checked activity monitor but a i don't know what i'm looking at and b the only cpu hog seems to be the kernel task which takes up about eight percent of the cpu and then the next large item is com.apple.speechrecognition core.speechrecognition which takes up 863.4 megabytes all right all right. This one is a 2010, and I have installed 16 gigs of memory, and I have a 500 gigabyte SSD. I am also using Ethernet directly from the iMac to the modem, and speed test says I'm getting 254 megabits down and 23 up. I am stumped. Does this seem right? Is the only answer to buy a new iMac? And I would say no. Now, while the 2010 iMac is now considered a vintage machine... Vintage being that Apple will no longer uh, repair it for you, but you can still use it. Um, it doesn't look to have the specs that are too far, far off from what I have, Dave, my oldest machine, which is a MacBook Pro mid-2012. Okay. Yep. Fair. Yep. Um, and it sounds like he's done every the best he can to get it to a point where it's not going to be resource constrained by RAM or SS or, or disk. And then he has an SSD and 16 gigs of RAM, which is what I have in, in this machine. And this yeah. machine uh, does not slow down. That's a good amount of RAM. I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you're going to be choking on that. So, right. um, and it doesn't sound like he's running a ton of stuff. Um, the beach ball is interesting though, right? Because that means the system is waiting for something, right? Like it doesn't throw the beach ball immediately when, you know, an app needs to go read something from the disc or use the CPU for a while. But it will use it will throw the beach ball after a few seconds of oh okay this is going to take longer so we better tell the user we're aware right that that's what the beach ball means so right I mean the only thing I would suggest you look at so this one thing occurred to me in the back of my mind here is you want to make one cause for a beach ball is if you're starting to do a lot of swapping 
Yeah. What's swapping? Swapping is when the system runs out of RAM, chip RAM, and needs to use the hard disk. Sure. Uh, to replace RAM, and because the hard disk, even an SSD, is much slower if there's a lot of swapping or moving of stuff between RAM and the disk, you're going to get that beach ball. I agree. Now, the way you could tell if this is happening under at least the current OS, um, uh, I would say probably the best thing is you want to look at the uh, um, memory pressure. And I think only if you're at a state where memory pressure is... is I believe the bar will turn. Uh, normally, it's it's one. I'm, I'm looking at the iStat menus version of it right now. Yep. But I would just look at that value. If you have something that's experienced what's known as a memory leak, in that it it runs out of control, and it could be the OS. I've I've seen this happen before, where a kernel task all of a sudden is taking up gigabytes, and it's like, well, that's not right. Or some other tasks. So you want to make sure that something is not consuming all of your RAM, because then you're going to get it, you're going to get into the swap situation, and you you will see that. Beach ball. Other than that, Dave, I'm suspecting it may be something filthy, like a cache, which is either um, corrupted or, or there's something wrong with it. So, the first thing I would try that can um, that can get you out of this situation here is something known as safe boot or safe mode. Yeah. And there's a handy dandy article um, called "Use Safe Mode to Isolate Issues with Your Mac." And they even say, if after running this, so it cleans up some cruft and rebuilds some things. And as they say in the article, you could read it. If the problem goes away, it must have cleared out some cache or directory issue. Um, beyond that, the other tool that I would use to, to further clean things up beyond the safe boot or safe mode would be to get our pal Onyx. If you go into the maintenance section of Onyx, they have several rebuild and cleaning options. So maybe that you got to rebuild something or clean it out in order for it to be recreated or rebuilt. And then you'll be okay. Um, other than that, Dave, I think, I mean, 2010, that's a good run, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, for I mean, sure. It's eight years old. I mean, but, but I looked, I mean, the specs of it aren't terrible. I mean, I think it has only SATA 2. Yeah. And it's a, you know, but it's a multi core gigahertz processor. So, yep. Yeah, that's, that's I, what I got. I'm running a couple of. Uh, I'm trying to think of my running. Yeah, I think I've got two 2010 iMacs running in the house, and I don't have 16 gigs of RAM. I think I've got maybe eight in each of them, but I've got SSDs, and I don't see this kind of slowness. I what where I see it slow down is when the CPU is pegged. I run iStat menus on them on them all my Macs, and it's a great way to know what the um, you know, what, like what's going on, where, where the, um, you know, where the bottleneck is. Right. And I can see, okay, you know, when I boot the Mac Dropbox goes nuts for a long time. Cause it decides it has to re-index everything, even though that seems to be overly obsessive and, and, you know, other things moving up. And honestly, at some level, I like the fact that I see the CPU is being fully utilized because it means there are no other bottlenecks, right? Like the, the disc isn't the bottleneck. I've got an SSD in there. And actually once it was when I put the SSD in years ago into that, that I first saw the CPU really start to get pegged on sort of normal operations. It's like, wow, this thing's been slowed down by the disc for so long. And that's why we've all moved to SSDs because, because of that. So yeah, it, but it, it, I don't see those kinds of beach balls all the time. It sounds like a RAM issue, right? Uh, you know, from the the way he described it, moving between apps takes forever. So I, I think heading down that path of looking at what's using RAM and is it swapping, like you said, you know, where it's, it's sort of writing something out to disk so that it has room to read something else in. With 16 gigs of RAM, though, that's a pretty tall order to fill that up for for sort of a daily use machine a 16 is you know i would say eight is enough uh 16 is is you know you got some some wiggle room there so yeah i'm i'm not sure it i mean you gotta look right you gotta look at, at what's running what's using your ram uh 
The kernel task you mentioned can be one of those weird things, John, because many apps will load their resources in a way that they in activity monitor get assigned to kernel tasks. So if kernel right. task is bloated up, it means something, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem with the system on your Mac, right? It, it might just be that it's obscured a little bit. And while we're on the subject of kernel task, although it's tangential to this potentially, um, Kernel task will also artificially report that it's using your CPU if the system has decided that it needs to throttle your CPU for, say, temperature issues, right? If your Mac gets, if your CPU gets too hot, the Mac slows it down and the way that it sort of addresses the, the, the fact that it's slowing it down is it will assign some percentage of the CPU to kernel task so that that's not available to apps that are actually going to use it. So kernel task can be a little bit misleading if you treat it like every other app and look at it and say, why is it doing all this? Well, it's special is really what it comes down to. So yeah, I like your idea about Onyx. That's, um, you know, and, and safe boot. I mean, both are doing similar things and cleaning stuff out. Uh, if you've cleaned up the system and you're pretty confident, and especially if you see that it's lots of processes running that are using thing, using up, you know, CPU resources and sort of stealing those from you, you'll see a lot of MD workers and MDS store that are doing, um, you know, spotlight. Then I, I think taking a look at app tamer from uh, St. Clair soft would be the answer there. App tamer. Uh, will throttle processes down to leave room for other processes. And that can be a handy thing too. So that's. And finally, yes, as suggested by our good friend, Brian Monroe in our chat room, which you can always attend at MacGeekGab.com slash stream. Brian is suggesting, and actually it's, I'll, I'll go with this. Yeah. Uh, it could be bad or flaky Ram. Definitely. Yeah. Yep, for sure. I mean, normally when you start up your Mac, it does what's known as a power on self test. And if the RAM is like totally shot, um, it'll make some beeps and say, yeah, your RAM's right. Your RAM's shot. But if the RAM's like marginal, you know, or if it, if, if it's having problems reading from or writing to RAM, um, it may be in a state where it's just try really trying and it eventually succeeds, but because it has to try so many times, to eventually get it right, um, uh, that that may cause a slowdown. So if you can get, I don't know, um, maybe try to reseat the RAM or maybe try getting some other RAM. I don't think the RAM for that machine is terribly expensive. Yep. Um, no, it's a good one. I, I, I had not thought of that, especially in the days of, you know, when <laughs> RAM was in sockets and stuff like that, if the RAM wasn't seated properly. Uh, you could run into uh, odd behavior. Yeah, for sure. Sure. Yeah. No, I like that. Yeah, it could be bad RAM. Uh, that would definitely, you know, cause those kinds of, th th that, that kind of symptom if the system is, uh, you know, uh, trying to read or write data to a, a RAM socket that's bad or a RAM chip that's bad, uh, it would definitely, could definitely slow it down. It could also just crash the system. Uh, that's, that's the symptom I've seen more often with bad Ram, but, uh, anything's, you know, hardware is one of those things when you've got a hardware problem, the symptoms are never consistent from machine to machine. It's just like, however it manifests there is how it manifests. So, yeah, that's interesting, man. Huh? So much stuff to think about. I like it. All right. Um, while we're on the subject of slow uh let's go to perry here john perry writes i have a 2017 imac 27 inch retina 5k uh, 32 gigs of ram uh, uh internal fusion drive but uses a, an external one terabyte ssd connected via thunderbolt as uh, the startup device he says uh, on startup using the ssd it takes from 45 seconds to three minutes for the Apple logo to appear, at which point everything proceeds normally. 
I've made sure that the startup disk is selected in the startup disk preference pane. I have zapped the PRAM and I have reset the SMC. I've disabled all startup items, etc. I've run Drive Genius and all other disk utilities known to man, and no problems are reported on the external SSD. The internal fusion drive starts up a little faster when I use that. About 30 seconds to one minute for the Apple logo to appear. Everything works fine after startup, but since my 2015 MacBook Pro starts up and I see the Apple logo almost instantaneously, I thought I would ask you guys if there is anything else you might suggest that I can try. So this is an interesting one, Mr. Braun, because the app, it not much happens before the Apple logo appears, right? The system does what you mentioned. It's power on self-test and, and then a few things because it's got to begin loading the operating system, but that's it. Then the Apple logo appears and, and, and boot sort of continues, but there are a few things that it does. And you can take a look at at least some of those, and and it, regardless of what you see, the, the, when you see it can can help inform you just as much. So I would try booting in verbose mode by holding down Command V at startup, or there's a terminal command you can type uh, setting the NV arguments to always boot in verbose mode. That will, in in a normal scenario, things in verbose mode will fly by so quickly. And I'm going to warn you in advance, they will be so tiny on your retina screen that it's going to be hard to even read it. But if the system is hung for a very long time, well, then you might be able to see what it's hung on or what messages are being reported in this verbose mode. What you're seeing in verbose mode is all of the Unix console messages that that come up during uh, during boot up, and it it like I said, it's going to be totally overwhelming unless it hangs somewhere, and then that can be really informative. And if it's too small, let's kind of combine a couple of tips that we've had in this episode. Take a picture and zoom in on it, and you might be able to see. You know, use your iPhone or whatever. Take a picture of the screen, and uh, I we've even had some people video with their iPhone of. Uh, of verbose boot so that they can then go back in and step through the video to see what's happening there. But with your issue being that it's slow, you might not need to step through at all. You might be able to see it right there. Um, I would try it. You know, you've tried a couple of things. You've tried booting from the internal drive. You've tried disabling startup items. You've tried resetting the PRIM and the SMC, all things that, you know, immediately sort of came to mind to me when you, um, you know, when first reading this, but uh, try unplugging all of your external devices, including your external <sighs> SSD, right? Because you beat me to it. Sorry, I was man. Say, unplug as many things <laughs> yeah. that you can, but, and let the machine still boot. So maybe just have the network cable in there, but you know, I'll, and any yeah, you shouldn't need a network cable to boot, machine. right? I mean, just power. I mean, you can oh, boot. Sure. A, you can boot a Mac with just power. You don't even need keyboard and mouse. Very quickly, once it boots up, right. it'll say, "Okay, like let, we need to talk." But, um, but yeah, j- just power. And and if then if that's faster, then start plugging things in one by one and see what it is that's slowing it down. Because uh, it could be yes, it could. Uh, there could be a, a discussion between the computer and a peripheral, and they're they're just not getting along, and eventually. It just throws up its hands and says, okay, I, I can't deal with you. Yep. yep. <laughs> but if you remove it from the equation, then it'll it'll blow past whatever. And it could be USB. It could be, yeah, who knows? Who knows? Right. But that, that it, it should not take that long to get to the Apple menu, um, or to, not to the Apple menu, the Apple logo. But it, the first thing that you, you mentioned uh, here, Perry, is something we should, all should remember, and that was... Um, he, the, the first thing he says was, I have made sure that the startup disk is selected in the startup disk pref pane. This is a very important thing in solving this particular problem. Because if your Mac does not, if you go into startup uh, disk in the pref pane there and you don't have something selected, what that means is that your Mac will have to uh, go through and scan all of your disks and make a decision 
about where to start from. Whereas if you have a startup disk selected and it will say it now in high Sierra, when you go into that pref pane, it will say you have selected Mac OS 10.13.6 on the disk. Well, my disk is called veered blues because I name all my discs after Miles Davis songs, but like that will be, it will be, not uncertain at all that you have selected a startup disk and you want to make sure you have one selected. Otherwise your Mac sort of has to scan everything and guess, and that will take longer for the Apple logo to appear. And you will sort of be stuck in that, that limbo mode for a while. Uh, the fact that this is happening, even with the startup disk tells me maybe the Mac is waiting for that startup disk to come online, right? He's got this external, Drive, maybe there's something either about the disc or the enclosure or the Thunderbolt cable or, you know, whatever, which is why then resetting SMC and PRIM makes sense because those are the things that, when it's hardware but not hardware, can often fix the problem. But he's tried all those things. So we don't have the magic answer here. But it, just from a troubleshooting standpoint and, and for us to all learn at least five new things, this these are important uh, steps to have taken. So I think it's probably, hopefully it's an external device and not something with the motherboard, John. Because it shouldn't take three minutes for that to happen. I don't think. So. That's right. Right? I mean, you know, it should go pretty quickly. Especially on that machine. I mean, that's a relatively new machine. 2017, right? It's pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. All right. Where are we on time here? Yeah, you know, my sister... Uh, and her fiance, Kristen and Jose, uh, pinged me yesterday and asked me, John, they said, is there any way to plug my iPhone into my TV? And they, they were looking to plug their phone into an older TV that doesn't have HDMI, which sort of made for an interesting concept. If your TV has HDMI, sort of the easiest ways to do it are uh, an Apple TV, right, for your iPhone, because then you can airplay stuff and you can either you know airplay from within an app or you can even do screen mirroring so you can see your phone uh a less expensive alternative is to get a google chromecast and many ios apps will let you cast quote unquote which is their word for you know their, their, their analog to airplay but will let you cast to a a google uh, chromecast that's also plugged into an hdmi port on your tv uh but that doesn't solve this problem. And so the, the problem was, okay, or the, the, the thought was, all right, well, how do we do this with a cable? And near as I can tell, John, I couldn't find anything that would go from a lightning port to a component or composite video port directly, right? You can get lightning to HDMI, no problem. Although there are some issues with that, as, I, as I'm finding out where some apps won't do HDMI, you know, lightning port streaming like Netflix. There's a lot of uh, lightning to HDMI adapters that, that Netflix won't pass data across. I guess maybe there's some, some security concerns or whatever that people could, you know, copy the content or something like that. So, um, but you can do that, but you can't, you know, with, um, with, uh, I, I haven't been able to find any cables that go to, you know, either what they call component, which is really RCA coax or, com uh, sorry, composite is RCA over a single coax, uh, sorry, coax over a single RCA and then component, which is the three, uh, HD, you know, uh, RCA ports. So you need a, a, an HDMI, you need a lightning to HDMI cable and then a box that will convert HDMI to composite or component video. And I found one of those at Amazon for like 30, uh, $33, $32.99 for those of you that, uh, that like to be specific about those things and it will do either. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes, but it's a Muso. It has 163 reviews with four stars and... Um, we'll do either of those things. So I'll put that in the show notes. Any, any thoughts on this, John? seems like from the, uh, from the uh, chat room, Brian Monroe saying, you know, as the setup that Apple uses for their keynotes, I'm sure is custom and not available to the public. I think that's right. And Warren is saying component to HDMI converter or a new time capsule. 
But Brian Monroe comes up with with something that um, that I had not yet mentioned, which is buy a first gen Apple TV because the first gen Apple TV has component video ports on it, uh, and whereas the all the newer ones have HDMI only. So there you go. Any thoughts on that, Mister Braun? Yeah, that's uh that kind of warms my heart that they're trying to use older uh, video technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I figured you'd you'd uh, you'd appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But no, the first thing that occurred to me was uh, Apple TV, which is what I do. So I just AirPlay it to right, right. My iOS device to my Apple TV. Yep. And, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Uh, <laughs> Warren in the chat room correctly says that the first gen Apple TV is as useless as a TV without HDMI because fixed on 66 says the first gen Apple TV doesn't have airplay. So this solution would not work. Yeah. Yeah. So much for that. I forgot about that. Really? The first gen Apple TV doesn't have airplay. Huh? Huh? That's, um, I guess that's right. Huh? I didn't even think about that. Huh, I wonder why not. Maybe it's because it doesn't have... Does it have HDMI? I can't remember. Let's look. I'll pull up the specs. I'll put these in the show notes too. Apple TV first gen. It does have an HDMI port, but it does not support AirPlay, huh? Okay. I, I'll believe you. That's that's bizarre. Huh. Okay. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. All right, uh, moving right along here. You know, John, we'll go to we'll go to Yanis because this is an interesting discussion. We'll, I think we'll probably wrap the show here, and, and we've got lots of others for for next week's show. Uh, Yanis says, "My beloved 2011 MacBook Pro died a couple of weeks ago, and it needs a new logic board, so it's not worth the cost." He says, "And I've been thinking about its replacement. However, I've not been a fan of the." previously current macbook pro design mainly because of the keyboard though of course this might have improved with the brand new 2018 models that came out last week uh he says i thought or two weeks ago i thought about upgrading in 2016 but decided to hold off due to the keyboard ish issues in the 2015 macbook then the 2017 and not much has changed etc uh he should said uh i should note that an imac is not an option as i need a portable computer and the non-pro laptops that apple offers at the moment are either very old the air or very slow for what i need the non-pro macbook he says anyway briefly these are the reasons why i'm not or haven't been keen on upgrading to a new macbook pro bearing in mind that in 2019 we might have a complete redesign what is your opinion on waiting for a year and not longer hopefully and in the meantime, doing the following. Using Carbon Copy Cloner to create a bootable clone of my Mac Mini at work. And then use that clone to boot my quote-unquote work computer uh, when and if needed at home using my girlfriend's MacBook Air. And in the meantime, using an iPad Pro at home for my everyday tasks. Is that a realistic solution for a year or maybe longer and is booting via an external SSD like Samsung's T5 usable every now and then when I need a computer thing done at home and I want to have my work environment there to do it? So this is, as I read this question, I thought, you know, this isn't all that different from what I currently do. You know, I have uh, a Retina iMac in the office that I use as my sort of daily driver at work all day and it's great and all of that. But at home, I don't, I certainly don't get on a computer every day uh, from the standpoint of I don't get on, you know, one of the iMacs that I have in the house and, or, or my MacBook Air. But, you know, once or twice a week I do. And they're slower computers uh, and they, but they, you know, they get the job done for when I need to do something. And I, if I need to really do a lot, I can, you know, just walk back across the driveway to the office at, you know, during quote unquote non-work hours and then things are fine. So, uh, but for the most part, when I'm just around the house, I'm using a 10 and a half inch iPad pro and it works really well. And I hadn't really thought about the fact that I don't really use a computer at home until reading Yanis's email here. And so I think, this is not only a, a workable solution 
uh, as a temporary stopgap, it might be a long-term solution where, you know, you've got a computer when you need it, but for most of the things that, you know, certainly for me, most of the things that I do, um, you know, an iPad is actually better because it's just easier to grab and sort of, you know, more built for that, that quick interaction kind of thing. Not that you can't do long interactions on it. And I do all the time, but yeah. What, so what are your, you know, what, what are your thoughts on this, John? And I, and, and, and Warren in the chat room asks, you know, a question that, that really does apply. What's the definition of a computer? And of course, all of these things that we're talking about, a Mac, book uh iMac and an iPad and an iPhone and your Apple Watch are all computers just different interfaces and and that sort of thing. So yeah, thoughts on this I think of the cute line in the Apple commercial where you know the kids using their iPad and yeah. and uh you know some adult says you know what you doing with your computer and the kids like what's a computer? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it is a computer. It's right. a computer without a keyboard. Right. <laughs> That's my only thought. Actually I saw um um, you know, we were driving around, uh, back to the airport, I think. And, uh, Allison, uh, I was in the car along with Allison and I saw her pull out her, uh, iPad pro. And I'm like, wow, you know, if I did at first, I thought it was a MacBook, some sort of a smaller MacBook. Sure. Um, I guess my only concern is that, you know, at least for me, um, I need a keyboard for most of the things that I do, not all of them. Yep. So maybe an iPad Pro with a keyboard would. And there's plenty of keyboard cases out there last I checked, right? Yep. <clears throat> yep. So um, you know, and it's a, you know, it's got a beefy processor and um so I think for most things, uh, the, uh, for me, and yeah, I think the the thing is my my current iPad Air is a uh, mm, not yeah, performing yeah. well. It had to be repaired, and and it, it does weird things every now and then. And right. I, I, I'm thinking the next iPad I want to get may be an iPad Pro with some sort of keyboard case, and uh, you know, try it as an experiment. The only thing that occurs to me is that it, you know, don't. It, it makes me uneasy trying to force the use of an iPad to do everything. Because it's not, the, in my humble opinion, it, it may not be the best tool for all the things you do. So you really have to think about what, what type of things you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, I mean, and you're just like typing and surfing and emailing and stuff. Um, it's, it's, it'll probably do what you need. But if you're doing like, you know, heavy video or audio production work, though I've seen people use an iPad to do that sort of thing. Um. You just have to reflect on on what sort of tasks you need to accomplish uh, with each device, because you you know you are limited with with an iPad as far as what you can connect to it. Absolutely, yeah, and and even workflow wise, an iPad gets it, you have to really be thoughtful about the path you're going to take, right? Like like I I the one thing that that for me is very difficult on the iPad simply because of, of how we do things with the show is answering people's questions from my iPad, right? Because when I answer a question, I want to then save that as a PDF in our shared Evernote. And I want to put it in our, uh, you know, working agenda document so that I don't forget about these things. And, and I realized that I can actually do that with a workflow, either by saving a screenshot of something and and then workflowing that into Ever, Evernote and and pasting it into our document, which works well, except for replying to an email because you can't print to PDF in that way when you're composing an email. So uh, with that, I I and I figured this out on the airplane actually uh, heading off to vacation, where I um, I now email it to myself at my special Evernote address and it goes into an inbox thing that I then have to go and triage when I'm at my desk. So it's imperfect, but it's doable. And it allowed me to answer some questions while I was away. Um, but that's sort of the point it, that I'm trying to make is, is you have to really think about how you're going to get things done from a productivity standpoint on the iPad. Whereas on a computer, it's, it's just a little more natural to it especially when you're trying to tie multiple apps together i guess i guess that's where productivity gets gets to be potentially cumbersome on the ipad but 
you know, where he's not talking about replacing all of his computing time with iPad time. Uh, I think, I think there's like, again, you know, for the most part, that's what I do and, and it works fairly well. So, yeah. Yeah. But you can't like forcing it, it, I agree with you. You forcing your iPad to be your main computer for most of us is, is the wrong decision. Uh, you know, my son, I was talking to my son about this. He's going into his junior year of high school. He's going to be doing a lot more writing. And so his older MacBook pro it, it, we're going to need to get him a new, you know, a new something. And I, I just said to him, I said, would a, you know, would a larger iPad pro be the right thing? And he was like, huh, you know, and so we messed around with him, and he's still on the fence about it. And I, I think really a MacBook pro is, or, or some sort of Mac laptop would be the right decision uh, for him uh, for that too. But it's just interesting kind of thinking about, thinking about all of this, that it's not, it's not as straight a decision as it used to be, especially for the the person that has say a a desktop computer and a laptop does that laptop need to be a mac you know or a macbook or c could it be a tablet like an ipad so like as the as the accessory computer the ipad can work really really well for many people not for everyone uh keyboard wise i i wanted to just kind of throw it out there because not a lot of people know about these bridge keyboards, B R Y D G E. They make your iPad feel like a, a, you know, like a MacBook in many ways, they fold in very well. They're sturdy. It's a real keyboard that you get to type on. So I'll put a link in the show notes to bridge iPad keyboards, but I've been, I've tested them out at trade shows and stuff. And it's been like, oh, okay. Like if I was going to do a lot on the iPad, this is definitely the keyboard that I would get. So, yeah. Ah, well, all good things, my friend, all good things must come to an end. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's this show. <laughs> and then ah. there's this show. Ah. Ah. Yeah. 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 But we must. Right. We must, my friend. We <clears throat> and must. And speaking must. of this show, yes. if you would like to provide input to us or have a question or a tip or any, anything else you want to tell us, one way you can go about that is you can send an email to feedback at MacGeekab.com. Feedback at MacGeekab.com is what my esteemed podcasting partner here said. We had to switch today from Discord back to Skype because otherwise we weren't hearing each other. So John's audio has that, that Skype hiss to it today. So I, I think you weren't able to hear him. That's why I, that's why I clarified. Yeah, no, you're, you're correct. And if we were using Discord, then you wouldn't have heard me say feedback at MacGeekGab.com. That's correct. Or any premium listeners, of course, you can email us at premium at MacGeekGab.com. All of you are welcome to call us at 224-888-GEEK, which, John, is 4335. Come check out our new forums at the Mac Geek Gab forums. MacGeekGab.com slash forums is the right way to get there. So much great activity out there. I uh, I sort of lost uh, lost touch with the forums while I was away. And I, I came back uh, on Friday and looked. And it was like, oh, holy crap. There's like so much happening out here. So really, really great stuff. And uh, thanks to everybody for... For jumping in there and helping each other out, it's what we do. We answer questions, and it's far more organized now, and we can upvote answers. And so pe when people come in six months from now with a similar question, they'll be able to find it. Oh, it's so, so cool. All right. I want to thank our sponsors, of course, uh, sponsors for this episode that included masterclass.com slash MGG, onepassword.com slash geekgab, linkedin.com slash MGG, codeweavers.com slash MGG, smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast, otherworld computing at maxsales.com. Barebones software at barebones.com. Ring at ring.com slash MGG. You all rock. Our sponsors rock. You folks rock. All of our premium listeners, you rock. Have a great week, folks. I hope everything goes swimmingly for you. We will see you next week. And between now and then, my friends, do me one favor. Don't get caught. Made up.